I'm recording. Thank you. My name is Gigi Naglak. I'm the Director of Programs at the New Jersey Council for the Humanities. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to our program today, Who Votes in a Democracy? Considering Historical and Current Restrictions on Voting. Uh, it, this is the latest in a series of programs that we that together form the Democracy Conversations Project, which is a new initiative to explore civic life and democracy in New Jersey by convening discussions among community members. So for this series, the New Jersey Council for the Humanities has partnered with eight of New Jersey's excellent community colleges, each of which will discuss a topic of importance to all New Jerseyans. As we think about civic life here in the Garden State and beyond, we are eager to explore not only our present circumstances, but how the past has led us to where we are today and how together we are going to create the communities we wish to see in the future. The Democracy Conversations Project is part of a national initiative called Why It Matters, Civic and Electoral Participation, which is administered by the Federation of State Humanities Councils and funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. We are, this project is also funded by the New Jersey Council for the Humanities. We're a state partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. I would also like to thank the New Jersey Council of Community Colleges for their support of this program. The program is being closed captioned. If you do not see the closed captioning and you wish to see so, you may have to enable it on your own Zoom using the closed captioning option at the bottom of your screen. If at any point you wish to make a comment or ask a question during the program, please use the chat feature through Zoom. Uh, we will be moderating the chat throughout the program and stopping as well for questions and conversation throughout. We are also, uh, the New Jersey Council for the Humanities is also live tweeting this event. We encourage you to follow us on Twitter um, and to engage with us using the hashtag democracynjch. So we are thrilled to partner with Union County College on this program. And I'm delighted to introduce our moderator for this afternoon. Dr. Pro Bernard Polnariev is an Associate VP of Academic Affairs and Dean at Union County College. Without further ado, let me turn the microphone over to Bernard to get us started and introduce our speakers for today. Perfect. Thank you so much, Gigi. And thank you to the New Jersey Council for the Humanities as well for their work, the great work. And I also wanted to thank the committee, Dr. Rotunda, Dr. Phil Pappas, uh, Joe Margiata, and of course, we have a student who also helped support this, which we're grateful for, American Honor student, Stephanie Brenner. So thank you. And on behalf of Union County College, the president of Union County College, Dr. McMenamin, and Dr. Lown, the Vice President for Academic Affairs, we're excited to be part of this talk and eager to present to you uh, today's panelists. So let me read you their bio and then we'll go straight into their presentation and discussion. And note that we'll have a chance for a Q&A after. So you're free to uh, include all your questions and comments and ideas into the chat question feature and we'll take them at the end. Uh, identify yourself. Uh, and if you're a student, please especially identify yourself. We love comments from students. So without further ado, <clears throat> let me start with the bios. Dr. Carol Birkin, She's the Presidential Professor of History Emerita at Baruch College and the Graduate Center as part of the City University of New York. She's the author of several books, among them are First Generations, Women in Colonial America, A Brilliant Solution Inventing the American Constitution, Revolutionary Mothers, Women in the Struggle for America's Independence, and a recent A Sovereign People, The Crisis of 1790s and the Birth of American Nationalism. She's a frequent contributor to the PBS and the History Channel, is often a panelist on programs at the New York Historical Society. In addition, Birkin is the editor of the Gilder Lehrman Institute's online journal, History Now, has directed numerous summer institutes for teachers, serves on the boards of national, the National Museum of Women's History and the New York Historical Society Center for American Women's History, and is an elected member of the Society of American Historians and the American Antiquarian Society. Second up, we'll have Graham Russell Gow Hodges. Dr. Hodges is the George Dorland Langdon Jr. Professor of History and Africana Studies at Colgate University since 
1986 and has studied African Americans in New Jersey even longer. Earlier books include Root and Branch, African Americans in New York and East Jersey, 1613 through 1863, the University of North Carolina Press, 1999, and Slavery and Freedom in the Rural North, African Americans in Monmouth County, New Jersey, 1665 through 1865, part of Madison House Publishers, 1997. His most recent book is Black New Jersey from 1664 to present day, part of Rutgers University Press, that was 2018, which won the Richard McCormick Prize for the best book in New Jersey history in 2018. Later this year, Rutgers University will publish his edition of the Marion Thompson Wright Reader with a biography, biographical introduction and a compilation of her selected writings. Hodges has also directed seven NEH summer institutes for school teachers on abolitionism and the Underground Railroad and has applied for a new institute in the summer of 2022. And lastly, as the last presenter, we have Jamel Holly. Assemblyman Jamel Curtis Holly is a graduate of Abraham Clark High School in Roselle, part of Union County, earned his Bachelor's of Science degree in Criminal Justice from New Jersey City University and a Master of Public Administration degree from King University. Holly has served as Chief of Staff to New Jersey's Deputy Majority Leader, Councilman at Large in the Borough of Roselle and as Mayor of Roselle. He has been honored by the Network Journal mag Magazine for his achievements and his contributions to the African American community and was a member of the Affirmative Action and Outreach Committee for the Democratic National Convention where he assisted in further diversity, furthering diversity and minority representation throughout the state of New Jersey. In January, 2015, Holly was appointed to fill a seat in New Jersey General Assembly representing the 20th Legislative District, becoming the first African-American to represent the district in the New Jersey legislature. In 20, November, 2017, he won election to a full term and was reelected in 2019. Assemblyman Holly has been a vocal advocate for the residents of the, his district and has demonstrated leadership on issues from supporting youth recreational opportunities and preserving open spaces to good government practices and accountability in government, government spending. He co-sponsored the new voter empowerment bill, which would have permitted 17 year olds to vote in primary elections if they turned 18 years old before the general election and was co-sponsor of the voting rights restoration bill, which restores voting rights to persons on probation or parole in New Jersey. Again, if you have questions or comments, please post them in the chat feature. Uh, we'll get to them at the end. Uh, please put yourself on mute if you're not, and we'll get to you at the end as well. Uh, without further ado, Dr. Birkin, floor is yours. Hello to you all. <clears throat> you may not realize this, but while today we think that voting is a right of every American citizen, adult Mar American citizen. In the 17th and 18th century, it was not considered a right, but rather a privilege that went to people very carefully defined by the law. They had to be white, they had to be male, they usually had to be some form of Christian, although uh, in some states Catholics were not allowed to vote, and they had to own property. Generally, that meant land, their own farm. It was assumed in the 17th and 18th century that if you didn't have something at risk, that is, you didn't have something you could lose by passing an outrageous or foolish law, then you shouldn't have the right to vote. You had to be, in their terms, an independent man. And this left out, as a result, any number of white men. It left out second sons and third sons who didn't inherit property from their father. It left out apprentices who were learning a trade. It left out tenant farmers who didn't own their land. And it left out all manner of urban day workers who lived catch as catch can and didn't really have uh, any property. I like to tell my students that this is analogous to a poker game. You can't play in the game unless you have something to ante up. And in their case, 
the idea was unless you owned property that you were at risk of losing if you made bad political decisions, then you couldn't vote. Uh, the one exception I might point out, and you should be proud of this, to the idea that only white males with property could vote was in New Jersey. Uh, the American Revolution had a lot of rhetoric about equality. It had a lot of re rhetoric about freedom and liberty, uh, but it was not assumed to apply to women or African Americans or Native Americans for that matter. But New Jersey, the men in New Jersey legislature, when they were drafting their constitution, apparently took this idea quite seriously. And in 1776, the New Jersey Constitution allowed women to vote as long as they owned property. In 1790, New Jersey passed the Acts of the 15th General Assembly, and that referred to voters as he or she, so making the point that in fact women could vote. In 1797, black women and white women in New Jersey were voting in the state if they met the residency and the property requirements. And I just wanna add that for a long time, people made fun of this or they belittled this uh, historian saying, oh, it was just an accident. They were in a hurry to write the constitution. They didn't know what they were doing. That's not true. They knew quite well what they were doing and they, made clear he or she, the Museum of the American Revolution decided to do an exhibit in honor of the celebration of women's suffrage. And they had some wonderful researchers and they actually uncovered voting records, poll records that showed women voting. So the evidence is there that women did vote until 1807, when the New Jersey legislature in its wisdom decided that it was time to revise the constitution. And at that point, they aligned themselves with the other states by saying only free white males could vote. So African-Americans and women of both races were eliminated. Uh, one of the reasons this was done was pure politics, which some of you might understand. Uh, the women tended to vote for Federalists, that is the Federalist Party of Hamilton and George Washington and, and John Jay. The Republicans, that is the Jeffersonian Party was making inroads into New Jersey. <laughs> they wanted to eliminate Federalist voters. This may sound familiar to you these days as voter suppression is going on in many states. So they managed to suppress the vote of women. Uh, there it stood until the 1820s, free white men who owned property were the only people who had the privilege of voting. Somewhere between the 1820s and 1840s, voting opened up broadly to all free white adult men. This is sometimes called the era of the common man, but it was not the era of the common woman <laughs> because they were not included. Uh, one of the ways I'd like you maybe to think about this is that one of the great engines of American history, that is one of the things that drives major events in American history, is the struggle to actually make voting a right, not a privilege. And we can see this develop. In 1848, women met at Seneca Falls and they demanded, among many other things, the right to suffrage, the right to vote. They didn't get it. After the Civil War, with the Reconstruction Acts, Black men, most of them just freed from slavery, achieve the vote, not black women. So do not put on an exam paper ever in my class saying black people got the right to vote after the Civil War, uh, only men. And this was a terrible blow to white women, white Northern women who felt that they had 
worked so hard for abolition and they had supported the Civil War, the North in the Civil War, and they assumed that they would be rewarded as well with the vote. But the word male for the first time appears in the Constitution after the Civil War. Black men's privilege to vote, and I'm sure Graham can talk more about this, was actually taken away by the end of the 19th century, both by Southern laws and by violence and, and intimidation of Black voters. And there it stood for, I'm not very good at math, I'd say 70 more years. Women got the vote in the early 20th century, although Black women really suffered from the same Jim Crow laws that, that suppressed Black political participation. And not until the 1950s and 60s with the civil rights movement did African-Americans of both genders uh, get the vote. So you can see major events and you can see major struggles that are all part of this struggle to make what we assume now in our lifetime is the American credo, which is that voting is a right of citizenship. Uh, however, right now, this very moment in our political history, that is being challenged with voter suppression, suppression, suppression laws all across the country. Uh, and hopefully, if you're participating in a discussion of democracy, uh, you will oppose this kind of suppression of the vote. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Birkin. Let's move forward with Dr. Hodges. Uh, thank you. It's, it's uh, always wonderful to uh, hear Carol Birkin uh, speak on the history of the women's vote uh, nationally, and of course here in New Jersey. I'm gonna be speaking more about uh, African-American voters and their history uh, in our, the Garden State, also make some comments about the contemporary situation. Uh, as Carol Birkin noted, uh, the 1807 law uh, took away the vote from uh, white women and also from African-Americans uh, who had been voting uh, in sizable numbers before that. Um, this, as she noted, is also the period of free white male suffrage. This is the kind of thing that she and I learned a great deal about in graduate school. Uh, but the reverse was the case for women in general and certainly for African-Americans. Uh, for African-Americans, voter suppression in New Jersey lasted from 1807 up to 1871 when the 15th Amendment uh, made it happen. Okay, So uh, this is a, a long period of voter suppression right at the beginning of our democracy. Another observation I want to make about this uh, is that this era was characterized by black alignment largely with one party initially. Okay? And that will be a pattern we'll see again and again. Uh, and that's not because of blacks were only prone to one party. It simply means that the other party was probably openly hostile to black votes. And that's certainly what happens when the older Democratic Party controls uh, the legislature in New Jersey. That doesn't mean, however, and we're finding out this more and more, that Blacks accepted this without protest. And from 1807 right up until the Civil War and beyond, we see a good deal of petitioning. Uh, we see a lot of conventioning. We see a lot of direct appeals uh, to politicians. I'm going to share the screen with you now and give you some titles that you might want to look at uh, very quickly. Um, but, oh, sorry. I'm going to do this, I hope, right. Uh, I want to screen sharing. OK. Am I off now? I want to show you some uh, slides of um, Sorry, right, just right. Here we go. OK, now I can get it. These are some of the newer books that you can find uh, that will talk about this new scholarship on petitioning, 
uh, and on black uh, political activity in the new nation. There's Martha Jones's work, okay. Um, sorry, I'm trying to show this. Uh, well, I'm gonna leave that, I think. Uh, I'm just gonna simply talk. Um, Anyway, uh, during this time, Blacks were quite uh, active on all of this. They would have meetings, state conventions. Um, and in 1846, a new Jersey uh, established a new constitution. Now, what Carol mentioned and I mentioned earlier uh, was that um, uh, the earlier 1807 was a law. In 1846, New Jersey passed uh, a, uh, a constitutional act which meant that only white male citizens of 21 years of age uh, who had been resident in the state for a year and the county for five months could vote, okay? This meant now that we're talking about uh, not just a law, but a constitutional amendment. And that really elevates the, 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 the problem, okay? Blacks continue to, uh, to, to uh, oppose this. Uh, and in a meeting in 1849 uh, in uh, Salem County, they talk about uh, how they feel they have the right to vote uh, because they are citizens, they're taxpayers, they're born here, uh, that uh, such acts are contrary to a Republican government and unconstitutional. And one of the most important people, uh, and I wish I could show his picture now, uh, working with this is John S. Rock, uh, who is an abolitionist from Salem County, a dentist, a physician. Um, and later on, he moves to Massachusetts, becomes a very important lawyer there, and even makes a case before the Supreme Court. Uh, he also talks about the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal, uh, and that this is something uh, that, you know, that this, he talks about as being a part of the disenfranchised, and he says, I don't believe your hearts are so callous as to listen to the voices of the oppressed, okay? Then he also talks about how colored soldiers fought beside you in, the, in your struggles for liberty in the Revolution, uh, in the War of 1812, um, and sailors served in many conflicts uh, during that war, okay? So he's arguing military service, the Declaration of Independence, uh, the constitutionality of the black vote. And even though they're not heard, these are the kind of drumbeat of protest that blacks put up during this period, also during the, uh, during the Civil War, okay? When uh, the Convention of Colored Men creates the National Equal Rights League in Syracuse, New York in 1864. There are a number of representatives uh, from, from New Jersey, uh, including uh, William Howard Day, who is a very well-known abolitionist. They create lawsuits determined to, uh, to, to, to regain the vote. However, that party opposition again, um, I'm gonna go, go, simply go back to where I was, okay. Um, the New Jersey Democratic Party opposed, listen to this, the Emancipation Proclamation, the re-election of Abraham Lincoln, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, okay? So here's a party which is really hostile uh, to, to black votes and will remain so until the 1930s when it will begin to switch platforms to the Republicans. And obviously what I just described is the reverse of what we have today, okay? The 15th Amendment passed uh, in 1870 the very first person to vote in the Nate, black person to vote is Thomas Peter, Mundy Peterson of Perth Amboy. Uh, and uh, he's, he, he places a ballot. He's the first one. Mundy uh, was actually a seasoned political figure. Uh, he'd been superintendent of the new public school building. Uh, and he had been part of the charter uh, movement in, in New Jersey. Okay. Now, from that point, African Americans in New Jersey make a wholesale association with the Republican Party, roughly from 1870 into the 1950s. And while the Republican Party was the party of Abraham Lincoln, generally they only gave lip service to African American needs. In part, this was because of the limited number of Black voters in the state. Blacks were a small minority of the population through much of this period. Uh, and also because the Republicans, if they were not as sternly racist as the Democratic Party were, uh, they didn't really see African Americans as an important block. Uh, and they gave very weak support. Uh, examples of that would be the Fairlawn decision of 1881, 
that bars segregation in schools, but school, the segregation continues right along anyway. Um, this continues to happen. Nonetheless, black political leaders begin to uh, continue to emerge. An example of this is George Cannon, whom I talk about in my book, Black New Jersey. Uh, Cannon uh, is president of the National Colored Republican Conference. That's for the nation. Uh, he's from, uh, uh, from, from Jersey City. He's a physician, uh, filmmaker. Uh, he's someone of, of enormous talents. Uh, he even seconds the nomination of Calvin, Calvin Coolidge for the presidency of the Republican Convention in 1924. Okay. Uh, but he's unable to make much of an inroad into uh, Republican po power politics. Uh, and after his death in 1925, there's really no one to replace him. Later on, uh, we see small bits of patronage, but no real representation. In 1948, there's a passage of the Civil Rights Act. Unfortunately, this does not encompass housing. And this dichotomy continues to characterize Jersey's record regarding school segregation and other forms of, of Jim Crow activity. Strong laws on the book, but very feeble action on the localities. Okay? Uh, and there have been several landmark court decisions later on. Um, so Jersey has the distinction of having the strongest state law against segregation uh, in schools and in, in the vote, but at the same time is re regularly listed as having one of the country's worst records of school segregation. There are, again, some differences on this. Eric Morrow is somebody I'd like to highlight. Uh, he's from uh, Hackensack, a very distinguished family. Uh, and after uh, becoming notable in, in part, as part of the Brown versus Board of Education decision, he becomes a special aide to President Dwight D. Eisenhower. And he's the first black special assistant to a president uh, in our, our history. Uh, he has trouble getting Ike to really move much on civil rights. Uh, and he's, and he's, uh, he does bring him together with A. Philip Randolph, Martin Luther King, Roy Wilkins, and other civil rights leaders, but Ike just doesn't push very much. And so Morrow leaves office very embittered uh, and regards himself uh, as a token. Uh, even though he campaigns quietly and persistently, it just doesn't work out that well for him. Again, he's sort of a captive of the Republican party. The big shift to the Democratic Party begins in the 20s with uh, 30s with FDR, but it really picks up a uh, swing after World War II, the policies of Harry S. Truman, and then the Newark Rebellion of 1967, the elections of mayors Kenneth Gibson, Sharp James, and today uh, Ross Baraka, brings this full swing to the Democratic Party. Uh, there are still attempts at voter suppression in 1981. Uh, there are policemen who arrived at the voter polls uh, in, in Jer New Jersey as part of what we call the National Ballot Security Task Force. Uh, and th this became so notorious that Jersey had to sign a consent form for a quarter of a century to ensure that ballots would be fairly done. I think the big moment for New Jersey and, of course, for the nation is the election of Barack Obama and the emergence of the black vote in, uh, in 2008. Uh, we can see uh, by 2012 that over two thirds of the eligible black voters in the state vote uh, for, for, for Obama. And this is a very, very high uh, level of, of, of support. Then following that, the election of Cory Booker to the Senate in 2013, the election of Ross Baraka in 2014, and a slew of other mayors. And Baraka also uh, uh, forms a mayor's conference for 21 other uh, black mayors in, in, in the state. Later, the election of Bonnie Coleman to the House of Representatives and Sheila Oliver, the Lieutenant Governor. The local level, we have uh, Leroy Jones, who is the Essex County uh, Chairman, and Jerry Green from, from Union County. And they are a part of the many, many black leaders who have emerged in the last uh, 10, 10 or 12 years, I think, since Obama. Uh, then, as uh, was mentioned earlier, also the uh, removal of uh, restrictions on those uh, people who committed felonies but served their sentences in Jersey is really ahead of the nation on that. Um, at a recent meeting with prominent New Jersey Black leaders, Governor Phil Murphy reminded us that 94% of Black voters elected him to office. So right now, the New Jersey African Americans are really wholesale voting for the Democratic Party, again, because the opposition party is so very hostile uh, to uh, their efforts. But at least now, I think we're seeing some real results. I'll stop there.
Perfect. Thank you. Dr. Rotunda, did you want to add anything? Um, <laughs> yes, I believe that um, Assemblyman Holly has not been able to join us yet. Uh, I assume he has other pressing business. Um, but I can speak a little bit if um, that's okay. And so you don't feel that cheated. When I was 19, I was elected to the uh, Democratic Town Council in my um, town. My father kind of got me on there and I had no idea what I was doing, but I was an elected official for about a year. So there you go. Um, would rather teach about it. Um, so when I thought about putting this panel together, you know, the idea was to look at, you know, sort of historically voting rights and where we are today. And if, you know, you were looking around, this is obviously uh, an issue of a lot of importance in terms of what's going on in the country and what's going on in New Jersey. And for me as a historian, it was really appealing to be able to kind of start at the beginning, you know, with the constitution, um, with, you know, limits on property rights. We think of a democracy as universal suffrage, but, you know, there's always restrictions. And as um, you know, Carol Birkin pointed out, there were significant restrictions early on in terms of property um, and other issues. Today, you know, it feels like we've come a long way and certainly many more people um, are able to vote. So I think we don't always think about the restrictions that are in place. And um, a few of the sort of clear restrictions, leaving aside some of the access to voting for the moment, um, are age, you have to be 18 to vote. This was something that actually was changed with the 26th Amendment in the context of the Vietnam War. Uh, it had been 21, but the argument was if you can go off and fight, it's going to be changed to um, 18. Um, you have to be a citizen, and you, which wasn't necessarily always the case. And you also, um, their voting rights are often denied to people who are incarcerated and even people um, who have been convicted of felonies. So I had um, wanted um, Assemblyman Holly to talk about some bills in New Jersey recently, uh, and I can talk about them briefly. And they had to do with both age and felony conviction. There are, we remember that there are different um, rules in different states in terms of voting. And states actually have a lot of discretion over who can vote. If you know anything about how the 19th Amendment was passed, women could vote in a number of states before the 19th Amendment. Uh, there was even Jeanette Rankin who was elected to um, Congress prior to women receiving the vote. So the states have a great deal of control over this. And if we look today at something like felony conviction, uh, and if you've been paying attention to the news, you'll see that different states have uh, different rules in terms of who can vote. There's only uh, two states, um, Vermont and Maine, that allow um, prisoners to actually vote while they are incarcerated. And just in 2019, New Jersey had a bill passed that extended the vote to those who were um, either still on parole or probation, not necessarily for those who are incarcerated, but as soon as you are released, the right to vote is restored to you. And that is an extension of the vote. And obviously the connections you know, to uh, you know, policing of minority populations make that a civil rights issue in many ways. Um, the other one that we don't think about as much is age because you know, 18 is an adult, it seems like, you know, makes sense you know, as far as voting, but there is a movement, there's actually a national movement um, to lower the voting age. It's called a Vote 16 USA to lower the voting age to 16. And part of the argument for this is looking around and you have seen um, young people participating in Black Lives Matter, young people speaking up in terms of school shootings. They were very prominent, um, you know, in the um, uh, Parkland shooting protests. You see young people um, talking about climate change, something that doesn't affect older people as well. And there have actually been some states that have moved towards this. Um, Maryland has a few towns, it's only at the local level, in which 16 year olds can vote in local elections. And California also has a couple of uh, towns that have allowed 16-year-olds um, to vote in school board elections. In New Jersey, there was a proposal a couple years ago, and again, Assemblyman Holly was one of the sponsors of this, to at least allow 17-year-olds to vote in the primary election if they would turn 18 by the general election in November. And a lot of the argument for this is, you know, if students can start voting while they're in high school, while they have more support, that this will create more, um, political awareness, um, young people vote in lower numbers than other people. Uh, that bill, interestingly, did not pass. Um, it's something that's being taken up in other states, but it did not pass in New Jersey. So 
what I want, you know, people to consider is, you know, it seems like we have wide access to the vote, but even in the um, requirements to vote, there are a lot of proposals that are out there. And, you know, it may not, it may not be unusual, you know, who knows, 10, 20 years from now to be like, wow, can you imagine we denied 16 year olds the right to vote? As a historian, I always try to imagine, you know, how we'll look back on this period of time. And then also quite relevant, I have to point out, is today um, Murphy actually signed a bill about in-person early voting. I don't know if anybody saw that. Um, it was another Zoom looking meeting. I saw it because I saw that Stacey Abrams was there, but I guess with the virtual, she was able to be there. And just kind of thinking, and, and I'd like to continue this in the discussion in terms of how, you know, we have some states looking to kind of restrict these rights. And then, you know, in other states, there's a movement to kind of allow more access and more eligibility for voting. So I'm really hoping that we can kind of turn this over to the discussion and really talk about, you know, some of these issues, again, historically and how they affect us today. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Rotunda. So I'd like to open up the floor. Comments. Let's demonstrate the real democracy with discussions. So I have a question. My name is Len Anyanwu. I'm a senior professor of economics and business management at uh, UCC. Good to see you guys. Um, in light of these differences, some of which Michelle referenced. Some states are being progressive in terms of letting people vote. Some states are going backwards, <laughs> like Georgia, <laughs> to name a few. Has there ever been any push sometime in the history of the United States to nationalize elections the way it is done in some other countries so that you have this standard uh, um, one size fit all kind of uh, ten in all the states. Has that has that ever uh, uh, been attempted in in America? I know you know there are some constitutional uh, issues or reasons why we may not be able to do that. But has has that ever been attempted? Or is there any kind of um, something that could happen here? Given federalism, that's really a difficult problem. States' rights did not die with the Civil War. States insist upon, the federal government controls the time of the presidential election. They, they can control that. But it would take a constitutional amendment, I think, to, and I don't think it would pass. That is states protect their sovereignty as much as possible. Uh, and when federalism was introduced in the Constitutional Convention, Alexander Hamilton got up and he said, this is never going to work. You can't have the states have some sovereignty, the federal government have some sovereignty, and some sovereignty be shared. It'll always create problems. And his solution was, let's just abolish the states. They didn't do that. But he was, as usual, absolutely right that one of the other great engines of American history has been where does ultimate power lie? And it's always been a complicated Gordian knot. And this is one of them. That is, you, you can't persuade states to give up a, a right that they have. Uh, they will be pulled kicking and screaming, if at all, into it. So it doesn't seem to me that that is ever going to, to happen. Though it makes perfect sense to me, uh, I don't think so. Dr. Hodges, did you want to weigh in? Yeah, well, it does happen, of course, with the 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment, which recognize uh, African-Americans as birth citizens, and then the vote in, for, for black males in, in 1870. And of course, that comes in the wake of the biggest war we've ever had. Uh, so uh, I think Carol Birkin's correct that you know it would take an enormous event like that to change or to for have the smaller states relinquish power. Of course, this is also a big constitutional issue: the anxiety of the smaller states. I mean, it's being commented constantly these days about the outsized influence of small states. Uh, you know, the, people are always talking about how Wyoming uh, has fewer people in the District of Columbia and has two senators. 
the same as California with 38 million people. You know, clearly the what we had in 1787 uh, is uh, been uh, is not the same condition we have now in 2021. Um, I think we're going to see something happen, not right away. I hope we don't need a civil war for that to occur. Um, but I, I think that in, in time, uh, especially if we have very progressive politics in place and the American people decide that changes are going to be necessary, that you're going to see some amelioration of that. Uh, the possible admission of the District of Columbia uh, as a state, as an example, or Puerto Rico, uh, that these would be states that perhaps would... Uh, uh, balance out uh, the, the the problems, but you know this is it's a big issue, uh, and Professor Birkin's quite correct. The smaller states are not going to give that up. Uh, the smaller rural, more rural states. Uh, these are some of the big divides that face that we face in American society. Uh, so uh, it's going to be very incremental. Uh, re restoring the vote uh, to people on parole is a very important step. Um, broadening the suffrage, fighting against local laws that discriminate. This, of course, is an area where we have some anxiety because of the conservative nature of the Supreme Court. If those Georgia laws ever get up to the Supreme Court and it approves them, well, we have a major cultural and political divide between, I think, what the American people want and what some of these smaller states want. Do you really think it's the smaller states? I mean, Georgia is not a small state. Nevada is not a small state. Really, the argument is between Republicans and Democrats. Well, it's I think not, it's all the problem is over race. Uh, I think that's really where the fault line is. It, yes, but- uh, I, I, I take your point about Georgia. The divisions are really now about who controls the state legislatures, which is, the point about sovereignty. As long as state legislatures and state governors have the power to make these kinds of decisions, not the federal government, I, I, I'm less optimistic than you that suddenly we're going to get a, 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 a national registration or a national uh, uh, voting uh, standard or for instance, a, the end to the electoral college, which is really what you're talking about when you talk about small state, large states. The electoral college, again, I, I tend to make sort of outrageous well, statements to my students, but Wyoming has more cows than people, yeah. you know, and, and yet they have two senators and they have uh, uh, presidential candidates visit them because they feel they have to. Uh, it, federalism is really an unworkable system in many, in many ways. I, I think, I mean, I do think Hamilton is correct. Not that we should abolish the states necessarily, but divided sovereignty, that is different sources of sovereignty. And in fact, when England and France and and Europeans heard what the Americans had done, they said, oh, that'll never work. And to a great extent, it, you know, if you look at uh, the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, the Hartford Convention, that the nullification controversy, that pesky little event called the Civil War, if you look at Awful Faubus standing in the schoolhouse uh, door saying, I don't care what the Supreme Court says, Arkansas is never going to integrate its schools. And even right up until today, when you have people saying, I don't care what the law is, I'm not going to bake a cake for a gay couple to get married. It, it's very hard to get a uniform rule about virtually anything. I will say that the Electoral College problem, and I think it is a problem, I agree with you on that, is gradually being changed by the decision of states to require that uh, their nominees to the Electoral College vote according to the majority of the, pop, of, of the vote. That there'll be kind of a voter take all. So I, I think the state has done that. They've done that in some states, but not all. <laughs> and again, I think it's going to be incremental, maybe longer than you and I are on this earth. Uh, but I, I think that these changes, there's going to be things coming up that are going to force these changes. Um, and we've already seen in the last year uh, an enormous transformation in our society because of, of COVID-19. Um, 
we'll see what else comes up that we're not expecting. But I, I agree with you that a lot of this is outdated um, and that it does not reflect the majority of the American people. Uh, Jack Pezza from Camden County College. I wonder, can we get back to New Jersey? Uh, I served on a school board of education for 15 years in New Jersey. And I observed what was going on, and that is the increasing segregation of the schools. And I wonder if uh, uh, Dr. Hodges, Dr. Rotunda could speak to this issue. It's actually, New Jersey has one of the most segregated school systems in the, uh, in the United States. What caused it and what can be done about it? This is a really a knotty problem. And I mentioned this in my talk uh, that there are great state laws but local ordinances have sustained segregation. Uh, it's, and that was the case before the, before the Civil War, but also, of course, even after the Civil War, you have the Fairlawn decision of 1881. They're going to integrate the schools and the Fairlawn people say, well, you don't have to. Then we have Jim Crow schools for another 75 years. Uh, the problem with, for example, the state constitutional convention of the late 1940s is that the Civil Rights Act didn't deal with housing. And if you have segregated housing, you're probably gonna have segregated schools. That's exactly uh, right. I uh, mean, so you then, don't you know, have these, to these, have these a law are, staying segregated uh, schools. You just have to make sure that neighborhoods are based on economic, sometimes on, on real estate understandings that you don't rent to Jews or to black people. But basically, New York City has the same thing. The public schools, uh, there are black neighborhoods and Hispanic neighborhoods and white neighborhoods. And that's based on income. And, and so you don't have to have a law that says segregate the schools. They're segregated anyway. And busing, if you remember, did not turn out well in many states. That is busing people from their neighborhood to make uh, 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 integrated schools did not work out well. So if you solved economic inequality, <laughs> which is a little difficult to, if you solve that, then you would have integrated neighborhoods and you would not have segregated schools. You know, There's one other issue involved with this. As you know, New Jersey has, I think, 602 different school districts. Some with no schools at all, including two in Camden County, and others with just one school or two schools. Now, there has been a movement to consolidate school districts into regional districts. Do you think that regionalization and a reduction in the number of school districts would contribute to a, a, a more integrated public school system in the state? You could, that's a start. Uh, I, I think what New Jersey needs, along with other states where these kinds of issues are important, and New York is very much like that, uh, there has to be a, a very strong popular sentiment. Uh, last summer, we saw an enormous amount of sympathy for the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. Um, stall a little bit right now, um, but I think, you know, there are. Uh, steps that are being taken coming out of that. There's more sympathy. We need to have some kind of a broad social movement that will solve the kinds of issues that Carol has mentioned about housing, uh, about income inequality. We need to have some kind, another civil rights movement uh, that will uh, deal with those kind of issues. Uh, I, yeah, I think the re more regionalization, uh, but it has to be a popular agreement on this. And that, we're, we're, we're a better there than we were a couple of years ago, but we still have ways to go. Yeah, see, one of the arguments in favor of, of regionalization is, is it is cost saving. That the pu per pupil costs of these small districts are enormous. A classic example of this is until several years ago, Seattle City had uh, a cost per student of something like $36,000 plus. And of course, once they uh, became combined with, with Ocean City, they significantly reduced the costs. So an argument, and this I think could happen in many, many other areas, that if you combine them, you can reduce it. Another example of this, uh, one of the wealthiest communities in New Jersey, as probably in the nation, is Haddonfield. 
Adjacent to Haddonfield is Longside. Longside is a predominantly African-American community, but yet operates a K through 12 district on its own. Whereas the larger borough of Haddonfield, of course, could very well merge with it. But the argument could be used that it might help to reduce costs. But this is just one of many situations where side-by-side -side communities uh, exist in such a way that they are segregated because of, uh, of um, uh, municipal boundaries. I would bet you would see the rise of private schools in the wealthy uh, uh, county and the rise of charter schools there, all of which would be designed to avoid the integration of those two uh, counties. That's happened in New York City. Uh, as soon as they uh, have a uh, school district that lets in Hispanic and black students, you get people racing to prep schools. Uh, th that is white prosperous people racing to prep schools and you see the rise of, now many charter schools have turned out to service an integrated population and they're, you know, that's a good thing. But there are ways around, there are, there are always ways around uh, actual multicultural life in America. The, you, you, the, the other thing that I would say. But <laughs> well, you also raised the issue of Lawnside and how that speaks to the complexity of local politics, because Lawnside is one of the oldest African American communities in the state. Uh, it goes well back into the early late 19th century, uh, and it's been, you know, enjoyed that autonomy. Uh, I'm not sure they would automatically want to integrate. Uh, there was, this is certainly an issue after World War II uh, with the Princeton schools, uh, which were the uh, uh, schools, in, black schools in New Jersey were, were excellent and they were not sure they wanted to integrate. Um, so, you know, it has a lot to do with, I think, with leadership and with a popular will. Uh, and Jersey, like New York, is a place of a lot of different localities uh, and very particular issues. So it's going to be incremental. Well, if, if I in, may. In regard to what uh, uh, Dr. Burke had said, now it's true that people will find ways to combat integration of school districts, but this was done in Virginia, as you know, in the uh, aftermath of uh, Brown, that Virginia on a large scale switched to private schools. Mm -hmm. And over the years, that has changed. And that's not the case in Virginia as it was uh, uh, 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. So I think there is a possibility to do this. And, and there are other states that we can use examples, but Virginia is a classic example where they virtually uh, reduced the public schools, which became large, largely African-American to uh, uh, penury. They, they, had, they had no funds and they had uh, no facilities, but that, that trend reversed itself. And Virginia is a far different situation now than it was in the uh, late 50s and 60s. Thank you. Before we move on, I want to get Dr. Anyangwu, and then I want to move on to a student who has a question. Yeah. Dr. Anyangwu? Thank you, uh, Dr. Pauline Arif. Uh, just real quick, the, the other point about regionalization that may not work so well is that it depends on the region. If the region is already not demographically diverse, then it wouldn't matter if you regionalize. For example, I live in Mormon County. They have a regional high school system here, but still there are a lot of black people that live in Mormon County to begin with. <laughs> so you can regionalize all you want. If the region itself is not that ethnically diverse, it's not gonna matter, right? Um, I don't know if you, if, 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 if you see that in other parts of the, of the state, what I'm describing that is happening in Mormon County, for example. So regionalization may not be the panacea that we're looking for. There may be other things that have, that have to be done if you're looking for integration the way you seem to be suggesting. Great point. Thank you, Dr. Nyamu. Stephanie Brenner, one of our Union County College students, uh, American Honor students, student, you have a question? A couple of questions? Uh, Stephanie, if you can unmute yourself, go ahead. 
So hi, I had just uh, put a question in there about what restrictions we had in New Jersey. Um, just because I have to admit, I had the ignorance of believing that you were 18 and a citizen, so bam, you could vote. Um, and I didn't really understand that there were restrictions as far as ID restrictions, which I'm finding out um, are in other states and is a hot topic. I wasn't sure if we had that here in New Jersey. So that was one question. And then my second part of my question is, I heard the justification for why people maybe didn't allow um, non-landowners to vote and all the different reasons why people weren't allowed to vote over the years, why they justified it when they wrote it into the law. But why, what is the justification for not allowing a prisoner to vote? Because it's my opinion that you may have a lot of innocent people behind bars and that these people have more sort of skin in the game when it comes to laws and legality that um, how is it that we justify taking away their voice? I speak to the second part, your second question. Uh, this, and this is something that uh, Kate Missouri has talked a lot about in her recent book and Van Goss as well, the restriction on uh, people in prison, convicts, goes really back to the very early days of the Republic, and actually before that in the colonial period. Uh, and it's something that, you know, uh, you know, has not really been reformed much. Part of it's because they're always seen as dependent. Uh, right. And this actually is an interesting relic of what uh, Carol Burke was talking about before, about uh, the need for a certain status in order to vote. Uh, and convicts being regarded as people who are dependent, uh, you know, that's, that's where they're, dis they're disqualified. And the registration process also begins after, war, after the Civil War. It's also true that today, the vast majority of people in prison are minorities. And there, is, there are people in power who do not wish to see them given the vote. Just, just on the principle that today most minorities, well, not that's a generalization, but many African Americans would vote for the Democratic Party. So there's the problem of controlling the 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 base for power in virtually every one of the questions that that have been asked. Dr. Well, Burke, it's interesting also is, that I think well made. The, but the you know, a classic example is Florida. Yeah. Florida, a couple of years ago, passed a, uh, a, state, a state resolution supporting felons being allowed to have the right to vote. Uh, and the Florida legislature, following that, intervened and passed, the law, passed laws to reduce the number of felons, former felons, who were allowed, uh, allowed to vote. And I think, as Dr. Burke, Birkin says, Clearly, it's a matter of race, that the majority of the felons, and especially in, in states like Florida, are in fact minorities. And uh, so for political reasons, that's what, that is what's done. But they actually ignore the will of the people and reverse the situation. Florida is just one, one state, I'm sure, that uh, that took place. Dr. Hodges, did you want to respond? Well, the, a couple of thoughts on this. Um, early in my talk, I said that one of the problems is of black affiliation with a particular party is not the fault of African Americans, but rather the fact that the other party is so hostile. And that was very much the case in the antebellum period with what was then called the Democratic Party. Uh, and it's absolutely the case, I think, right now with the Republican Party, mm -hmm. uh, that you know they're, they're really kind of in a one-party situation uh, for any kind of uh, voter reform on the deals with these issues of race. Uh, because there's one side, and we can see this very clearly with this voter suppression movement right now, that uh, you know wants to limit, um, and is largely on the basis of race. We have a question. Thank you, Dr. Hodges. Uh, let's move on to another question that was asked in the chat, and I think it would be great for a conversation and further discussion. Dr. Rotunda mentioned that this came from Bianca Feliciano, by the way. Dr. Rotunda mentioned that Murphy passed a, a bill allowing New Jersey residents to vote. Is it due to our state adapting to the new COVID-19 lifestyle? Could it be to avoid an issue of miscounting the votes that we have for presidential election? When can non-citizens be allowed to vote? I feel they are indirectly affected by decisions made when we vote. Thoughts? I, I didn't follow. That's, I think that's a real tough one. 
You mean the voting, uh, being allowed to vote early or vote by mail? Was that the concern, the question? Bianca, Bianca can you expand? If you're still on. I think she was asking about whether or not being simply a resident of the state, regardless of citizenship, to allow you to vote. Um, I mean, there's certainly an argument for that because there are so many people who are uh, living in the United States now and not voting. Uh, and they, I'm sure, over, almost overwhelmingly are poor and non-white. Uh, so this would be another area of reform. Um, but it's, it's, it's something which would require some major uh, mind changes. It, it would require granting citizenship to people who came here illegally, which is right now uh, a, a topic of tremendous controversy. And so first you would have to, one solution would be to grant the path to citizenship and grant citizenship. But the, fra the very phrase illegal immigrants tells you that there are people uh, in power in legislatures that are not going to want to see that happen. You know, the, the, if we look at this historical bent, one of the complaints that African Americans made before the Civil War uh, in New Jersey was that they were not allowed to vote, but someone who arrives very recently from another country, they're mostly speaking about Irish voters, uh, could do so very quickly. Uh, and the term illegal alien really is a product of the immigration acts after the 1920s and beyond. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, it's not, it's something, it's, it's fairly recent. Um, up until then, it was pretty easy to gain access to citizenship and, and to the vote. Okay. Uh, so these are again, reforms that have to happen. Um, the DACA act certainly could, could allow people to, uh, to vote rather, rather, rather quickly. Um, yeah, I mean, we just had we had to go back to where we were as a nation and welcoming people at the same time, not have those restrictions based on race. Thank you. That some of the arguments I've seen for non-citizen voting is the whole taxation without representation thing, that if you're working and paying taxes, you should have a right to vote. And I know at least in San Francisco, there were, I think, it, I'm not sure if it took place, they passed a bill to, um, again, allow non-citizens to at least vote in school elections, you know, the idea that you had children in the school and you should have a say. So just like the, uh, the under 18, there's been a little bit of movement in that, really just in some localities that tend to be more progressive, but that seems like that's getting challenged again as well. You know, I, I mentioned the practices of the 18, the, the antebellum period. Um, in some ways, I want to, maybe Carol Birkin could respond to this a little bit. The whole issue of citizenship and non-citizenship for people who are living in the United States, paying taxes, paying social security, which they're not getting, um, it's kind of a relic of the colonial period and about one status and whether or not you, you should be allowed to vote. Well, in the colonial period, it was generally assumed that you were not entitled to vote based on race and gender. For instance, Margaret Brent in the 17th century was the uh, executor of the estate of the Cal Calvert who owned Maryland. I mean, it was his state. And so she controlled a, an enormous amount of land and controlled this. And she went to the, the assembly and she said, look, why can't I vote? And the answer was, because you're a woman, period. No matter how much money you had or property you regulated, you're a woman. So no, you can't. And so that kind of uh, uh, gender-based exclusion uh, uh, is part of the colonial heritage. When I grew up in Mobile, Alabama, <laughs> uh, I left as soon as I could. I grew up in Mobile, Alabama, and there they had, in the 1950s, uh, uh, literacy tests. And they were allowed to have them because they gave them to both black and white potential voters. So they said, see, it's equal. But I watched as they gave a comic book to a white person coming up to register to vote. And one of the Federalist essays, I mean, I didn't know what it was at the time, but now I know, to the Black 
voter and you had to interpret what it, what it meant. So there are all kinds of ways that we have been able to, we, that people in power have been able to achieve the ends they want while appearing to be democratic in their behavior. It sounds very much like uh, the 1920s when incoming immigrants were given intelligence tests. Yes. And the interesting thing about it was they gave them the intelligence test in English, resulting in the conclusion that based upon object objective results, 75% of all Sicilian immigrants were morons. And you yeah. the term used at the time. And, and there you, what you see, those laws, Congress appointed, the Senate appointed this blue ribbon commission in, in 1920 of, of scientists and senators. They were going to determine who ought to be allowed in and who shouldn't based upon their national characteristics. So, of course, the Dillingham Commission, which published about 20 volumes, reconfirmed every bias that white American, Anglo-Saxon Anglo white American Protestants had so that uh, Jews were greedy and Polish people were stupid and Italians were sleazy and Greeks were dirt. And that's what they based the immigration quotas on, this so-called scientific study, which of course it, it really wasn't. Uh, uh, there's a book called Race and Nationality in American Life that spells out the manipulation of that, that blue ribbon panel to make sure that the immigration quotas, and you saw echoes of it with, with um, Trump saying, we'd welcome anybody from Scandinavia. <laughs> you know, that as long as you're really white, as long as you're from Northern Europe, come on in. But those immigration quotas that were passed in the 1920s were to keep out undesirable people from the nor the southern Mediterranean uh, areas. Uh, well, contrast well, also, that. The United States was at that time the center of the eugenics movement. Yes, exactly. Leading universities exactly. in the United States. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, after World War II at Nuremberg, there were Nazi, including Nazi doctors, who argued that they did what they did in large part because they were following the uh, leadership of the United States and eugenics movement in the United States. Many libraries, when the Nazis came into power, many American libraries quietly removed all the eugenics books from their library because they were embarrassed about it. But you are right, that movement begins in the, in the 1870s and 80s, and it's going strong in America uh, for quite a while. But compare that with the Hart Seller Act of 1965 and the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which established lar much larger uh, uh, immigration uh, from Africa. Actually, the, almost the first Africans to come to the United States have come in the last 25 or 30 years after about a 180 year hiatus, when before they were forcibly uh, 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 um, had to, uh, for forced to come. Uh, as enslaved people, uh, but also Asians. Uh, much of the, the complexity and the, the nature of our society has changed dramatically because of the Hart Seller Act, because of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And that was done, I think, and I, I talked about this earlier, by a national will. Uh, and it's true that there are people who resisted that, but it was still something that was widely supported and has changed our society. <laughs> I don't think we want to go back to where we were in the 1920s. I know there are people who want to, that to happen, but I don't think that's the national will. Thank you, Dr. Hodges. Let's move on from the roaring 20s. Caitlin uh, may I had a question. It was sort of answered, but I think we could talk a little bit more about it more in depth. What happens if you aren't able to register 21 days in advance? Wouldn't it be more beneficial for it to be the same day voting? There could be more of a turnout. Thoughts? Sure. Yeah. It also would be better if you simply were automatically registered to vote when you turned 18. Passive you, you get you get a selective service high. How are you when you 
they ought to have just automatic national, I mean, if I ruled the world, that's what we would have. You would have a, a, you're automatically registered to vote. Instead, what we have is a lot of states in which they say college students cannot vote at their college. They have to go home to their native state or then in order to be, be able to vote. This is to prevent young people who tend often to be more progressive uh, from voting. So uh, there are many ways in which you could ease voting simply by automatic registration. Yeah, and I think also on mail-in voting sort of speaks to this process, but it's always stunned me why we have a one day vote for these hugely significant elections. It could be a week. I mean, and mail-in voting in a way creates that possibility, yeah, yeah, yeah. but you have states in the in this country that actually end the vote at 6 p.m. And it's not even a national holiday. No, in, it's not. In most. Uh, well, it, you know, it could be an entire week when you yes, votes are registered. Yeah, it, it, most advanced countries, it's a day off from work. In, in America, it isn't that, mm, mm, I would say most of our voting laws are designed to suppress Massive voting rather than to encourage massive, massive voting. Uh, yes, the system does need so much work, Stephanie. You but there are, are things happening. Yes. And I, I again, I go, I want to go back to the optimism of the 1960s. Um, and also, I want to, I, I, what I saw last year was this ex extraordinary explosion of votes uh, for, for Joseph Biden. Uh, and it's true there were, there were a huge number of votes for Donald Trump, but the turnout for Biden was really extraordinary. Uh, and I think it gives one, one people, I think, and that's, that, that's a, a nominee, I think, who would expand the vote. Thank you. Another question, comment came from Abraham Suarez. Can we talk about the flawed 13th Amendment? Comments? And this can open up to others. I saw Dr. Pappas in there, if you have. Well, the 13, yes, the 13th Amendment is flawed in the sense that, again, this is the kind of thing we, it goes back really to the early public about people who are imprisoned, being unable to vote. And of course, this was abused heavily, especially in the Southern states, but also in the North too, by uh, incarcerating people. Uh, and the, they're losing the vote as a result. Um, because they're in a sense they're held they're they were still held to service uh so it, it was it sort of was an enormous thing because it ended slavery and i've been talking a lot about this with my students you know you this was the economic engine of the nation slavery uh and yet it's ended after a, a major conflict and then a, uh, we are a, a country which ab abolishes it but then there are clauses in there loopholes which are exploited by states afterwards, and certainly, yeah, the uh, the, the rise of prisons, especially in the South, uh, is, is 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 part of that, and then that, and that speaks to the issue of uh, of convict voting. But again, these things are they're not new; they're just ways in which those who want to restrict voting uh, have have tweaked the laws. Others, okay. One another question offered by Gigi, our very own Gigi. Thank you. Are there any democracies globally that have al that allow non-citizens to vote? That's a good question. I don't know. I I, I, I don't believe so. No. I think it's very difficult to, especially given African uh, uh, migration into places like Sweden uh, and and other Scandinavian countries that have raised racial concern concerns uh, that they would not like to let people, these, these immigrants vote. Uh, I was quite surprised. I went to Sweden not too many years ago and I thought, oh, they're the most liberal people in the world. And all I heard was watch out for your pop pocketbook, those black people are going to steal it. And so you begin to see wherever a, a homogeneous population is, is uh, threatened that 
the concern about letting people who are not citizens and making sure you don't let them be citizens, uh, giving them special work visas instead, which I think in Germany was the pattern uh, with African uh, uh, migrants or immigrants, that you begin to see a concern about you being born in that country uh, and having a, a, a birthright that belongs to you and not to people who are not native to the country. Uh, related to that is the issue of people in living in a country and voting in their home country. That issue became somewhat controversial uh, with Turkey and with uh, Erdogan's uh, attempts to, uh, to change the nature of Turkey from a uh, democracy to uh, something bordering on a theocracy. And, and you see it. Try to do that by trying to limit the voting of Turkish citizens living in the United States and other Western countries. You know, I was thinking about what Carol said about uh, Scandinavia and Europe in general, but also uh, other large nations, China, Russia. Um, we've had a lot of criticisms about the United States this afternoon, and a lot of them are very warranted. Uh, we are still confronting these issues. Uh, a lot of other nations aren't. Uh, and that has to do with our democracy. Uh, I think also the influence of uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson in particular, uh, that we really do try to, to work out solutions. Uh, we don't always, it doesn't always, it's not, sometimes it's flawed. Um, and sometimes we're disappointed. There are certainly are periods of retrogression uh, as we're seeing the attempts to make be suppress the vote right now. Uh, but we do confront these issues about citizenship and, and votes uh, in the United States, not perfectly, but we do do it. And in that sense, we are kind of an advance to the rest of the world. It's interesting, interesting you mentioned the thing with uh, Turkey going the other way around. I noticed there's a lot of resistance on the part of other countries, not just uh, in the North. When I say not, I mean the northern countries, in the south, like Africa, Latin America, a lot of resistance to what we call dual citizenship. Uh, a country like Nigeria, for example, which is a country that I was born in, uh, resists this very, very uh, furiously because of the political dynamics there. They feel like if they open it up to uh, Nigerians that are outside of Nigeria, they will take over politically. You know, they will bring on due influence in terms of who gets elected. So a lot of times this is about the dynamics of political power in these countries uh, right. that you're mentioning, right? Uh, what the example you gave was the case of Turkey, but I see that happening in a many other places that they resist dual citizenship. If you are gonna be an American citizen of Nigerian extraction, well, then you stay over there. You don't have any say uh, as to what happens in Nigeria. Uh, and, and that is because the politicians down there are scared <laughs> that, that, that if the Nigerian American, for example, comes home with his ideas and his money, they're going to take over power. Right? Not so true. I'm not sure Israel, what was that. Israel allows, Israel allows uh, dual citizenship. Uh, and sure. I, I don't know if you're allowed to vote if you're an Israeli in America, but you're allowed to have two passports, you can be an American citizen and an Israeli citizen. Uh, my wife votes in Canada and also in the United States. Uh, and you know, she has dual citizenship. But I take your point. Um, and this is a world problem about limiting dual citizenship, uh, especially, well, at least until recently, <laughs> we were a highly mobile uh, species of people. Uh, that's of course sharply been curtailed by this last year. And I'm not sure where that's going to be headed. Um, but you know, in other nations, China, for example, does not recognize dual citizenship. Uh, and the Chinese diaspora is enormous, uh, not just here, but also in Canada, uh, in Europe and Africa. Uh, so when those people become citizens of those countries, they lose their, their, their Chinese passport. And that's a big deal. Uh, so yeah, uh, this is something that's a real problem. Now, some very large uh, nations have uh, enormously high voting rate among citizens, but their elections are charades. And China is a perfect example of that, that I don't recall offhand 
percentage of people who vote in elections. In fact, in some, some nations, it's mandatory that you vote. But then again, the determination of who wins the election is made before the election is held. If there's only one candidate, you can have 100%. Yeah. <laughs> there yeah, are years ago, I actually met some uh, members of the minority parties in China. And these were holdovers from uh, 1949. Uh, and they were not interested in running for election. Uh, they, they were members of the party. They, they, they met every now and then. But it was more a social club than it really was any kind of a political organization. What's interesting is uh, I've spent some time in Iran. And Iran is a, a theocracy, but a limited theocracy. And it's always been amazing to me that in recent years, presidents of uh, presidential candidates in Iran who were not supported by the Bullahs end up winning the elections. And uh, granted, the Bullahs themselves, a limited number of people that can run, but people whose views are significantly different from that of the uh, religious authority are able to do that in Iran. And that's happened in the last uh, several Iranian, Iranian, Iranian uh, presidential elections. Thank you. So we have five minutes left and I know Gigi needs time to finish up, but I wanted to give 30 seconds to both Dr. Birkin and also Dr. Hodges, just to give some concluding thoughts and then we move on to the final piece. Is that okay, Dr. Birkin? Sure. Final thoughts? Uh, I think that power relationships are extremely important in understanding the ebb and flow of democratic reforms in this country and that power relationships need to be studied in the context of what it means to have to have a democracy. Thank you. I've spoken a lot about New Jersey and I want to end by returning to that focus. Uh, New Jersey now is largely a democratic state um, but of course with a very strong uh, Republican Party as well. And New Jersey also has some very significant problems in housing, schooling, we talked about. I think that there are ways forward for, for New Jersey where it can be a beacon for the nation in solving those problems, but there has to be that kind of universal spirit. And if there's some way we can figure that out, I think that uh, Jersey can uh, be a very progressive model for the country. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. Thank you again for the committee for putting together and the humanities, the Council for the Humanities. And thank you for this group for great questions, great comments, great points, and our students who have joined us. Thank you. That's true democracy. So we're grateful. Uh, Gigi, take it away. Amazing. Thank you. I'm going to add my thanks here too. Uh, we can't get enough thanking really. Uh, thank you, Bernard, for your um, excellent moderation of this panel. And it, I would be hugely remiss in not thanking um, Dr. Michelle Rotunda, who has been our coordinator from Union County College. It has been such a pleasure to work with you, Michelle. Um, so exciting to watch this, this panel come together. And thank you, of course, to Dr. Birkin and Dr. Hodges. Uh, I've been big fans of your work for a very long time. So it's really exciting to be sitting here uh, speaking with you today. With this, I'm gonna actually stop our recording Okay.